Barbara Scott. I'm the Vice President of AMM and also am the Director and Chief Curator at Jane Addams Hall House Museum uh, here in Chicago. It is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Mindy Fulalove, a wonderful colleague from the New School in New York. Uh, and when we were looking for guest speakers, we had a huge ask. <laughs> We wanted someone who could speak to the intersection of the current health pandemic and all of the racial disparities that have been compounded through this crisis, and someone to speak to the important civic unrest that has happened from the, in the past several months and triggered, among many other tragic events, by the murder of George Floyd and several others who were victims of police brutality and a long, and a long string of injustices. We also wanted someone who, even if they were outside the museum world, would understand us as museums, our social role and responsibility, and our potential, especially in the present moment. And Mindy Fulalove checks, certainly checks all of those boxes with her incredibly interdisciplinary background. And I know she doesn't want me to do a long bio, but it's her fault for having so many great things to talk about, so bear with me. Uh, Mindy is a medical doctor, a board-certified social psychiatrist who explores the ties between environment and mental health. Uh, she is dedicated to the psychology of place, and her research started in 1986 when she linked the AIDS epidemic with place of residence. She continues to focus on the health problems caused by inequality. For the past 30 years, Mindy has been investigating how broken connections between different sections of cities harm public health, and she explores ways to reconnect them. Mindy is a professor of urban policy and health at the New School. She has published numerous articles and six books, including Urban Alchemy, Restoring Joy in America's Sorted Out Cities, and Root Shock, How Tearing Up City Neighborhoods Hurts America and What We Can Do About It. And she, she's going to talk a little bit about this project. She is the founder and co-chair of what I would call a public history project, uh, 400 Years of Inequality, uh, and Mindy is going to talk much more about this project. It is a coalition and a call for everyone to observe the 16th, 19th anniversary through their own stories and local places. Mindy also serves as board president for the University of Orange, a community organization and free people's urbanism school that builds collective capacity for people to create more equitable cities. The organization's new collective recovery pr project provides tools for organizations and communities to heal from trauma together. So today we're very fortunate that Mindy will speak with us about the complexity, urgency, and possibility of these times, especially for the role that museums can play in this moment in helping to shape a more hopeful and equitable future. The title of Mindy's presentation is Correcting Historic Lies Toward a Collective Recovery and Better Future. Thank you for joining us today, Mindy. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, it's, uh, I've been watching the list of all the people who are here and all the museums you represent. It's uh, quite a wonderful collection. I wish I could see all of your museums. In fact, I'm, I'm just back from vacation and one of the great disappointments uh, of our trip was that there was a local history museum, but it was closed and we didn't get to see that. It's something we love to do as we travel. Um, I think I'm gonna share my screen, I am. And uh, I can make everything behave. Um, yeah. So, I, uh, yeah, thanks Jennifer, and Jennifer knows that I'm uh, like a huge fan of Hull House Museum. I try to go every time I'm in Chicago, and um, uh, the 100 Years at Hull House is one of my favorite books. I, I think as somebody who studies cities, everybody who studies cities should read that book. And uh, we hope that you will get it back uh, in print on demand so that everybody can have easy access to it. That's a plug. Um, and I wanted to start with this uh, quite remarkable photo of one of the things that Jane Addams and her colleagues did at Hull House was what they called a labor museum. And one of the things that she mentions is that among the immigrant groups in their neighborhood, people did spinning in different kinds of ways and with different tools. In fact, she said the whole history of spinning 
was evident in, in these various approaches. And so, um, but also at the time, immigrants and their history and tradition were very much held in disregard. And often the children looked down on their mothers or whoever was doing the spinning um, as being old fashioned and like, don't do that, you embarrass me. So she wanted to lift up this, this important knowledge that people had brought from the old world. And so they did a display of spinning um, in what they called a labor museum. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's sort of like many things at Hull House, uh, groundbreaking, but also paradigmatic. It, it is what we have to do all the time, I think, um, in a country like ours that, that suffers from such a profound founding contradiction. So this is, as you all know, the Jefferson Memorial, incredibly beautiful place in Washington, D.C. Um, so last week, one of the great, 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 great grandchildren of Thomas Jefferson, Lucien Truscott IV, did an op-ed which was published in the New York Times in which he said he thought this should be taken down, or not taken down, but that Jefferson should be taken out, and this should be a memorial to Harriet Tubman. Um, and, and part of the reason was, he said, this is not helpful. It glorifies Jefferson, and he's a complicated person. He said, Monticello is enough of a memorial for him, which, um, having recently been to Monticello, I, I, I think is really quite one of those astounding statements. So one of the most difficult experiences uh, with truth well, I've had many, but one of the more difficult experiences with truth that I've had in my own life is that my favorite college professor um, was uh, abused his daughter. So I'd read many of his books, but then she wrote a book about what this about her life, and this was part of her story. So reconciling my deep love for my teacher with what he had done to his daughter, this history of abuse. Very, very, very challenging for me. And I think this is, this is the, if you remember that movie, um, I think it's called A Few Good Men, where Jack Nicholson says, you don't want the truth, you can't handle the truth. This is what we're talking about as really the job of all of America. Because America is founded on this deep contradiction. Jefferson writes, all men are created equal. He doesn't include women. and he owns slaves and he does not free the slaves that he owns on his death. And into the Constitution of the United States, it's written that slaves will be counted as three fifths of a person. So conceptually, sl slaves, black people, were not fully human. And we haven't got past this problem. So when we think about the killing of George Floyd, how does a policeman hold his knee on somebody's neck until they're dead? Um, if he thinks that person is fully human and worthy of being treated like a human being. This is the contradiction in Jefferson's life and a contradiction in all our lives and in all of our places, including our museums. So when I got to visit Monticello, I had a tour with a history professor, uh, sorry, a law professor, UVA, Bill Bergen, um, who took us to see the slave quarters and talked about Jefferson's relationship with his slaves. And one of the stories that he told was of Jefferson growing up with a young boy who was a slave. And that man, that man became his, the head of his stables uh, and was somebody he depended on throughout his life. He was away when that man died. He, people sent him a letter. When he wrote back, the only thing he asked was, who will replace him? He didn't share any grief for this childhood companion. Um, now, for me, I am somebody who adores Thomas Jefferson. So, as with my college professors, very jarring to not that I didn't know this or hadn't heard about it, but to hear the stories of his letters, to stand in the place where his slaves lived, was really to take it to a new level. And and this is really the Nicholson's challenge: Can we handle the truth? And so this whole, like, if we can handle the truth, we can be free and we can become a nation that we can be proud of. If we can't handle the truth, if we continue to hide it, we can't move forward. 
it's very hard to realize that our idols are imperfect. And yet, all of us are imperfect. So this is a task that we have to have to grapple with. This painting was in the Cleveland Museum of Art. And uh, aside from, I just thought it was a wonderful painting. I was really struck by the way the, the museum was trying to get at this issue of the truth by what they had attached to the painting. Um, and it's very possible this was at the Montclair Museum of Art, and I forget exactly where I saw that painting, but I think it was in Cleveland Museum of Art. Anyway, it says, set in rural Long Island before the Civil War, this scene of an African-American laborer eavesdropping on a fiddle tune suggests the divisive race relations in America at the time. While a love of music connects the men and acknowledges their common humanity, they nevertheless occupy different spaces. The barn door that separates the laborer likely serves as a symbolic reminder that he lacked the political rights and social privileges of the white men inside. And I just want to highlight this political rights and social privileges of the group of white men inside, because that gets right at what we are struggling with in our country, that, that this is a painting of the color line. And it allows us to ask, what is the color line doing in our society? How has it hurt the man outside? And how is it hurting the men inside? The color line is not benign in either direction. This is perhaps the most difficult truth that we all have to grapple with. It is often uh, described in ways that the, that the people who are under the heel of the oppressor are suffering, but if the oppressor has his heel on the oppressed, the oppressor has to stay in that, locked into that position. This, it's a Manichaean system in which we are all trapped. And this trying to divine the harm that the color line is doing to our society is the, is the larger task. We, we, have to, we have to see the completeness that's displayed in this painting. That this is about the division and ultimately the destruction of our society. While in Cleveland, um, I was, went to visit this um, former Jewish synagogue, which had become a Pentecostal church in uh, East Cleveland, a neighborhood that has suffered terribly from disinvestment over decades and decades. And then I was also in Oberlin, where the main street was prosperous and lively. Um, and again, we see the, the effects of the color line, the disinvestment of the African-American community, the prosperity of the white community in Oberlin, that, that uh, money only goes to some places and not others in our society. And so people do not have equal chances, but this harms all of us. Um, so how do we begin to see this? How do we begin to talk about it? Um, it is not easy, yet there are examples. So Jennifer mentioned that I was part of a, a project called 400 Years of Inequality. You can um, see our project on the internet at 400yearsofinequality.org, 400, like the number. And our project was a call to the nation to observe 2019 as the 400th anniversary. We, we started in 2016 and did three years of work in, in inviting people to participate in many, many groups, about 150 but that told us what they did, um, did various things, including the Allen Memorial Museum of Art in Oberlin, uh, which did a wonderful exhibit on the Black Atlantic. So during that project, a group of us went to Nantes, which is a coastal city in France, which was its leading port in the slave trade. And as relations between white Nantes and people of color deteriorated at one point, the city decided that it had to confront its history, that it had to face its role in the slave trade. And they did this in a number of ways, but one of them was that they created a memorial to the slave trade at the port. 
And here I am with walking down the stairs is my urbanism teacher, Michelle Cantal Dupar. And you go down into this memorial, which is right alongside the river. And so it's very much like being in the hold of a ship. It's very claustrophobogenic, if there is such a word. But it, on the, while you have that feeling of being in the hull of a ship and really wanting to get out, alongside are writings of many, many people, Martin Luther King, Desmond Tutu among them, um, about the meaning of freedom. And so you can walk through this space feeling this, the bearing down of, of what the space, how it is, and yet the uplift of freedom. It's quite a remarkable memorial to the slave trade. And on the surface, they have the names of all the ships that sailed from the port of Nantes. The museum has also, Museum of the City of Nantes, has also taken up this challenge and went into its archives to find many, many, many wonderful artifacts about, um, about the trade, including this painting of, of a rich woman of Nantes who is being served by uh, the slave who works for her. Um, and you'll notice again the color line in this painting. So the rich woman is, is in the foreground and the slave is behind her. Um, and it, it was, there was very, we had a guided tour of the museum and a, a really great interpreter of all the paintings helping us think about what we were seeing. Quite a remarkable uh, set of archives, but also, you know, again, not that I didn't know about the slave trade in some ways, but they kept the record of all the money that they made. And, and uh, there are things about the slave trade that, I mean, I never thought about how much per head they were getting for the slaves that they successfully landed in some city. So the terribleness of it, the sort of there was a slave trade, yes, but it was a terrible trade in human beings. That was revealed by this museum. And, you know, again, a, a truth that, that you have to wrap your arms around the whole story. A, a very great gift to be able to visit Nantes and see those two exhibits. The, Jennifer also mentioned that um, my colleagues at the University of Orange and I are working on collective recovery. And so collective recovery is a concept that we use was so what does society have to do after a disaster? And, you know, society has to repair itself. This is not something where people who are traumatized can get sent to individual therapy. The society has to get it together and repair itself. But our society, cut into pieces by race, by class, by gender, by religion, by sexual orientation, by ability, all of these things that have fractured us, has a very hard time getting it together. We are not together. So the disaster fractures the fracture. It makes us into smaller pieces. And this becomes very apparent when you study the ability of the fractured society to get it together to respond. The fact that the United States has what some people consider the worst pandemic response of any nation in the world, and certainly any rich nation, is, a, is a, what we would call, a, you could call it a sign or a symptom, of the underlying social problem of being a divided society. We can't get it together to save ourselves. We're going to drown in our own division. This, this diagram was created by my colleague Lourdes Rodriguez for her dissertation. I, I just love the way it looks like little pieces of glass. And there's something about the sharpness of it and the, the way they've fallen apart that re always reminds me of how the edges of this. So as a society falls apart into pieces that are different, the pieces are also angry with each other. So when in the middle of that, something like the murder of George Floyd takes place, 
we are in a position for an, an eruption of anger. But the anger is about the whole thing. And the anger can come in many directions because everybody's angry. It's an angry set, it's an angry way of organizing society. It's not helpful. So we, uh, um, Lourdes Rodriguez, um, Leslie Rennes, Molly Kaufman, and a number of other people and I from uh, our research team worked on collective recovery after 9-11, after the collapse of the World Trade Center. And we knew from our work on cities that organizations were the mesh of the city, that they had really the power to make things go in a good direction. And so we asked ourselves, what are the tasks of organizations in the process of collective recovery? What are things people do together that they have to do together? So we said, this is about remember, respect, learn, and connect. But these are the tasks of organizations. And our basic thesis was that if every organization did a piece, its piece, that the whole society could blossom again. And th this is the thesis that we took into the 400 years of inequality effort, which was to say every organization has a piece of this history. And there's so many organizations that have looked at their piece. So, uh, you know, there, you know, there was a town in, uh, now I'm going to forget. There was a town where a black veteran, was taken off a bus and beaten until he was blind. And they put up a memorial. There was a whiskey, which was invented by a black man, but always credited it to a white man. Where the whole whiskey manufacturing changed the story and told the truth. So many organizations taking a piece of this. And that's what's required now is both that more and more organizations take a piece of these dual, well, really three huge dilemmas this um, inequality that's written into the founding documents of the country in undermining our commitment to equality, as well as this pandemic, this whole new virus that we've never seen before, which we are managing as badly as can be managed, and climate change. This virus comes out of the processes that are creating climate change. So we can never forget that we're in a deeper ecological crisis. All of these can be managed if organizations will mobilize to remember, respect, learn, and connect. So many kinds of things went on as part of 400 Years of Inequality. My, my students at the New School made a timeline. And the timeline depicted events in the history of African Americans, women, Native Americans, and working people, so that you could see how these, how the concept of inequality, which gets created to justify and reify slavery, imbues everything about our nation. Um, so these are students at the Breadloaf School of English. So they're English teachers and uh, people who want to write and teach writing. And their assignment was to look at the timeline and then write a letter to somebody on the timeline. You can imagine the kinds of letters that they wrote. Um, and they picked very different people. But um, the one that makes me cry just to think about it was a letter to a Cherokee woman on the Trail of Tears. People have so much to say to history and, and they're so willing to be in the presence of it and to rethink it and to find a way to connect through this, to walk this journey in which, although we can't handle the truth, we learn how to handle the truth, we must handle the truth. We can't necessarily do this alone. That's why organizations have to take us by the hand so that we can remember, respect, learn and connect. I also had the opportunity while I was in Cape Town to visit the District 6 Museum. Having written a book on urban renewal and how that destroyed American cities, uh, anybody who's been to South Africa will say to me, have you been to the District 6 Museum? Um, and I hadn't had the chance to travel to Cape Town, but when I got there, 
but made a beeline for the District 6 Museum. This photo is a panorama of District 6, which was an interracial community in South Africa, in Cape Town, which was destroyed when the apartheid laws were passed because it, it violated the spirit of the law, which was that people had to be separated. However, nothing was built in this space, so it remains vacant. And, and for the people who were part of District 6, it is very much their hope that District 6 will be rebuilt. So they, in a church that was part of the community that still stands, they created a museum, this remarkable museum. And what's on the floor is a map of what existed. And so people can go and they can find their homes and they can remember their neighbors. That, that um, this is the truth and it helps us to understand what apartheid did and what apartheid was. I wanted to go back to this painting from the museum at Nantes um, and compare it to a painting that's at the Valentine House in Richmond, Virginia of Aunt Betsy. Uh, this is one of the few actual portraits of a person who was enslaved that exists. And I, I think the contrast is, is, is really important, is really what, we're trying to, what I'm trying to talk about today, that the, the slave being the shadowy deliverer of confection versus the actual revered person that th this is the contradiction that we live with in our country so deeply in, in, in our bones that the pain of, of coming, into, coming into the presence of the truth is almost beyond our ability because we can't handle the truth. That, that line by Jack Nicholson is one of the truest lines in in, in films, so we can't handle the truth. So we need, we need you. This is the bottom line that I want to convey to you. As people who uh, welcome us in, who arrange the space to show us, who know about artifacts and processes and history that when you do what was done at Monticello to, to rebuild the slave houses and to show us the truth of slavery, to help us understand that this hero of ours, Thomas Jefferson, was somebody who enslaved others and who didn't truly believe in equality, that we can, you can help us handle the truth. And in that way, you become Organ part of this mesh of organizations. That's your piece to do as we try to struggle through. Um, we are gonna have so many deaths from this pandemic that we needn't have had. But what it's trying to teach us is that we're a very fractured, broken society. We're not who we try to pretend we are. And so, if, if there is a silver lining in this pandemic, it's that we can learn the truth about ourselves. And if we can take that truth seriously, we can go forward and work on climate change and maybe save our species. So much depends, much is in, in the hands of each organization, but in the hands of each of your museums is a piece of this truth that I hope you will help us incorporate into our beings. Uh, thank you. Wow, thank you, Mindy. Uh, what a great presentation and wonderful visuals, too. I saw a lot of comments coming in about that. We did get one question in the Q&A, and I welcome our other participants to, you know, enter questions into the chat or into the, the Q&A for us to, to share with Mindy. Um, one person commented, you know, on the remember, respect, learn, and connect this idea that museums can help us to help our society do this. The question was, how do we get to civic action after that? What, what is the, the step beyond that moves people to make change? Um, 
do you see museums in that role or do you see museums really in that the formation of that that discovery um, it's not trivial to tell the truth in your museum because there are a lot of people who don't want you to tell the truth so that is a civic action and and you not only have to tell the truth you have to get people to want to come and see it oh. um, one of our colleagues dr angela costa has done a lot of work with our timeline he's trained in mindfulness and his doctorate is in mindfulness education and he's been working on the problem of how do you help people look at the timeline so he's brought in mindfulness practitioners and people who do breath work to help people stay calm while they look at the timeline he's the it was through his work that the idea was shared with us about people writing a letter to somebody on the timeline so um i think that there's so much to be done to walk people through the through what is the truth um, that if you did that piece, you don't have to do it all. And you, but if you did that, if you brought every school child into your museums, um, you know, and you thought about what was your piece. I did notice that the, there's a the John, one of the leaders of the John Deere Museum is here. So what's the part of the John Deere Museum in telling this story? Um, can you talk about, I don't know if the John Deere Museum would let you, but John Deere is a, a big manufacturing company and organizing the workers there for decent pay and good jobs was, was very important. Um, and so they might not let you tell that story, but what if you could? So, and what if you couldn't, but somebody else nearby could and you could help out with that or, or whatever. It's, and also, all of you are a network. And so part of this is, how can you use the network of all the museums to lift up the truth? You don't necessarily have to be the ones who, who go uh, demonstrate in front of City Hall or the state capitol. You have to teach people. So uh, if every, but somebody else, other people are doing the demonstrating. You don't have to worry about that. They're gonna come to your museum and see stuff and they're gonna say, let's go demonstrate. So they'll have that covered. But can you show them the truth? Great, thanks, Mindy. Um, we had another question come in uh, in the Q&A in the chat, and I'll get to the chat in a moment. Uh, in the Q&A, it says, it's, clear, it's wonderful ideas. It's clear you really believe in the power of museums and historic sites to remember, connect, et cetera. But only a fraction of people ever experience museums. Can you talk about how we might dismantle some of the barriers to participation, tangible and intangible? Um, well, first of all, only a fraction of people ever do anything. Um, so, so I don't think you have to worry about that because the, what you want to do is influence people. And the, so the people who come to museums are people who are thought leaders. Well, and they come to museums because it's a place to think and to learn and to grow. So you're getting to a key group. Everybody wants to reach more people, but you, you reach who you reach. And so I, I think uh, uh, one of our slogans at the University of Orange is that everything we need is already here. Everything you need is already in your museum, including the people that you need to reach. So I think the issue is less uh, that you need if we start from the from the concept that you don't have enough it's discouraging like we don't have the right people we don't have this we don't have that you do have enough you have wonderful people coming to museums they're open to your message and you can take them the next step or the next couple of steps so I, I think if you could just say okay what do we have um, that then things will prosper what, what do you have that you haven't shown or what do you have that you haven't shown in conjunction with something else you have? All of you have archives. What have you got? For example, Jennifer Scott, if I may go back to that, there's this amazing book, 100 Years of Hull House, which last time I looked, which wasn't that long ago, was still out of print, right? Can that be, but now we have print on demand. Could she, she's got that book. And that book teaches you how to be a multiracial society. Can 
there be a new edition of 100 Years at Hull House with a new, a new intro that, that all of you put in your museum shops. Maybe there's a traveling exhibit, 100 Years of, at Hull House, How to Be a Multiracial Society, and, and even better. Um, and Jennifer will organize it and reissue the book. <laughs> I love that idea. I'm sure Jennifer does too. <laughs> Um, somebody commented in the in the chat that um, some of the struggle for museums starts internally. Um, you know, breaking down the barriers uh, is hard when they struggle with dysfunction internally. Um, you know, and, and I could say that just an extension of that is I think some of the I don't know fa failure to launch in terms of trying to, to tackle some of these issues and figure out what to do and and make changes sometimes because people worry about how it will be perceived or if it will seem genuine because they still are working on so many things internally. Um, I think your, your concept of, you know, tackling one thing at a time, you know, picking, picking a, a truth to, to bring to light as a place to begin. Um, but do you have any advice for museums that may feel like they struggle with this internally, um, you know, from a leadership and structural perspective, but also, you know, decision making and culturally. You know, if inequality is, is the foundation of our society, there's nothing that escapes that. Nothing. So it's going to be replicated at every level of scale and in every institution. So of course it's in your museum. It's in my school. It's in my street. It's everywhere. So the issue is, when you look around and you see it, first of all, the big question is, can you handle the truth that it's in your space? Uh, and then the, the second question is, is how, how would you like to take a piece of this? And I think that one of the things, and one of the reasons I wanted to start with talking about Hull House and Monticello is that I think those are organizations that have been way out ahead. Think of the Jefferson family confronted with Jefferson's children who, you know, on the other side of the blanket, right? So they had to figure out what to do with all Sally Jennings' children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. That were children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of Thomas Jefferson, just like they were. So I think you can call up Monticello or invite them to do a webinar for you and say, Monticello, how did you do it? because they turned a corner. You could get Bill Bergen on the phone for, to do a webinar. Man, he was amazing. He was like, he could handle the truth and he was like laying it on me. Um, he also took us to see the Octagon Room, which was very special. Um, one thing about knowing a lot of architects is that, is that they tell you how to get inside tours. That's amazing. Anyway, call up Monticello and tell them to do a webinar because they did it. And they, uh, they, they must have had more trouble than you're going to have. It had to be. That's great. Thanks, Mindy. Great suggestion. Uh, I see a lot of positive feedback, too, for your idea for another 100 Years of Hull House <laughs> edition. Um, you've also been suggested to write the foreword for it. Um, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <not> my pleasure. <laughs> I, I, did, I did write a, an article for the American Journal of Psychiatry about Jane Addams. When I first proposed it, they said, she wasn't a psychiatrist. I said, what are you talking about? She founded all of social work. She was a better psychiatrist than you or me. So they let me write it. Yeah. Well, I saw that Jennifer did post a question also in the chat, um, wondering if you would be willing to talk a little bit about Root Shock and that your work with that project and writing and how it connects to all of this. You know, um, uh, can I just go back to Hull House and my heartbreak? You know, Jane, the whole house became, went from being a one house to being a complex in about five years. Unbelievable. And then, um, so then I was like, I was going to Chicago. I so like, wait, I could go see it. And I looked it up and it, it was all gone. And it was all gone because of urban renewal. So um, I studied, I used Ruchak as case study of what happens to people when they lose their neighborhood. Um, and so, the, the root chalk is a term from gardening, if, if any of you are gardeners. And 
it has to do with like yanking a plant out of the ground and, and breaking all the tender little pieces of the root. And so the, the plant goes into shock. Even if you do transplantation nicely, plants can go into shock. So root shock is that, it's that being moved. And, and if you do it badly, they can die. Um, I can't see everybody. Uh, I can only see the people on the board, but um, how many of you remember the story of Heidi? Heidi? Yeah, you can raise your hands. Yeah, okay. Um, it, so Heidi, you'll remember, gets taken away from her grandfather. Charles is nodding. And then eventually she gets to go back, right? And we all remember the scene of uh, Shirley Temple running to grandfather. Grandfather, grandfather, I'm back. Um, well, Heidi in the book by Joanna Spirey um, is dying of nostalgia, which is a term originally proposed by Swiss physicians, Swiss psychiatrists in the 1600s, that meaning pain for the lost home. So the Swiss doctor who gets called in to see her because she's not doing well says, no, she's got to go back home right away. You send her back home. And when she gets back home, she prospers again. And not only does she prosper again, but the little girl that she was staying with in town comes and walks again. So Heidi is a story of Ruchak. Uh, any other questions? We've got lots of comments uh, in the chat too, Mindy, um, which I'm happy to share with you later if you don't get a chance to look. Thanks, Charity. Any questions from the board or from our other participants today? All right, well, Mindy, this has been Wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us today, all the way from New York City, uh, and and make, carving out the time to, to share this great and, and honestly pretty practical message. So thank you for that. Um, Jennifer, any final thoughts from you on Mindy's uh, talk? Oh, I, I think this is all wonderful. I like your challenge for museums to think of ourselves as networks with other cultural institutions. Um, and I'm just wondering, I mean, maybe that's a part of your collective recovery. You know, you had those, um, that approach, I forget what it was now, connect, learn, respect. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about each of those. I mean, it sounds simple in some ways, but I, I'm sure it's not as simple as it is or everybody would be doing it right. But that approach that you instituted to collective recovery and why those four in particular um, tenets. So it's remember, respect, learn, and connect. Um, and those four are tasks of groups in face of disaster. So in a disaster, the, you know, everything is broken. And there's a lot to remember. Like, as certainly after 9-11, we needed to remember the lives that were lived by the people we had lost. So r remember is, is very important for groups to do in a disaster, in the recovery from a disaster. We've lost so many people to COVID and so many more than we should have lost. How will we remember their names? The, so remember is part of it. Respect, because when you get fracture on fracture, disrespect flourishes. So how do you promote respect? Becomes very essential. Uh, you can really have escalating intergroup tension because the pieces are, get angry with each other. A lot of anger in, in a post-disaster period. Learn because you got to learn how to get out of the disaster. And for example, in Charity's slide, she showed all the webinars, all the things people, the, all the, they were offering, for example, how to reopen safely. There's so many things to learn. We've never seen this virus before. How do we manage it? We have all had to learn. And, you know, police violence. How are we going to, what are we going to do about that? We have a lot to learn. How are we going to be a better society? It's about time we learn that. So, uh, so remember, respect, learn, and connect. So all of this is about, in our organization, this is what we do. But then we connect to other organizations, to our constituents, 
and to policymakers. So that's remember, respect, learn, and connect. And uh, the University of Orange has launched a collective recovery project, um, and we're doing our first training starting next week. But if you were interested in participating or learning more, just reach out to me. We'll be glad to teach you. It's it's not really everybody is doing it. If you think about what was the first organization that really moved to the threat of COVID, it wasn't the U.S. government. It was the NBA. The NBA canceled its season. They just did that. That was a powerful, powerful move. South by Southwest canceled. So organizations have incredible power. And, um, you know, when Walmart this past week said, we're going to require masks, it's after that that the president says people should wear masks, after Walmart. So this power of organizations is the power that we need in this moment. In a highly fractured society, it's the organizations that have to step up and lead the way. Great. Well, great closing thoughts there, I think. Um, I see no other questions come through, so I just want to say thank you to Mindy once again. I know um, Leslie have some, has some final words for us to close this out, but I just wanted to make sure everybody on the call today, uh, on the event, knows that we will be sharing a recording of this um, after, and um, please, please spread it, and sh spread the word, share this idea with uh, all of your colleagues and, and fellow members. Leslie? And I'll add my thanks as well to Mindy. Those, um, your presentation really has my mind thinking. I work at a college. I'm at Grinnell College. We are still trying to figure out how we safely reopen and bring back a student body that is not just national but international and all that that entails with bringing it into a very small rural community. Um, and we are, um, we're still wrestling with that. Um, so to me, that work of recovery is quite daunting, but your observations and directions and the whole idea of remember, respect, learn and connect, I think is really something I can take back to my staff um, as we do the, the hard work of trying to figure out how we continue to serve all of our audiences, both on and off campus. Um, and I know all of our museums really can help us with these challenges with because of the creativity and the compassion that you all bring to the work that you do all the time. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. It's great to have this brief time together. I wish we had the longer time, but next summer we will be together in Milwaukee. Um, and in the meantime, I look forward to seeing you at a meeting or a webinar or an online conversation or a workshop in the year ahead, Charity will be in touch, I know, with all sorts of opportunities. Um, so I wish you all strength in, in your museum community and in the communities of all sorts you create at your institutions. And we at AMM are with you for the journey. Have a good evening. <laughs>